I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. You got space, man. Huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wrestle Rock Podcast. I'm your host, Nostrada Ben. And I host this episode with my colleague, Johnny D. How are you doing uh, today? Yes, uh, I'm going super great. And you know what? No. We, we are already on our uh, fourth season, as usual. Yeah. And we have none other than a special guest. Well, special is, guest, yeah. uh, Mr. Michael Modest, uh, better known as Mike Modest. So as you going today, my friend? Hey, guys. How's it going, man? Thank you for having me on, fellas. You're yes, welcome. we're going great, and uh, we have uh, a little bit of uh, time to discuss all together, so this is very appreciated, and we would like to uh, talk about uh, your, um, your, debut. your debut. So, did you receive uh, coaching from Rick Thompson and Jerry Monty, the former uh, APW coaches, or what is actually Roland Alexander who served as your coach you know right um <clears throat> so what happened was Jerry Monty was the first guy that trained me and Jerry was enhancement talent or a jobber for a uh, WWF at the time okay. now WWE and uh so Jerry was the first guy that trained me and uh he 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 did it for very little money i didn't have a lot of money i was 18 you know and uh his school was a long was far away from my house so um on the weekends i would head down there and and you know train basically on the weekends and uh what happened was roland had been he he wanted to be in jerry's shows and so he had asked if he could manage Playboy Buddy Rose on one of Jerry Monty's shows, and Jerry said, "Yeah, you can manage. You can manage Buddy Rose because Roland had been friends with Buddy Rose for years, and Rick Thompson. And Rick Thompson was also wrestling for Jerry. Okay. And uh, so what happened was we got to the show up in uh, I think it was Lakeport, uh, California, and um, we get there, and then Roland is trying to talk to Buddy Rose to see what you know what they're doing that night and uh when he finally talks to buddy buddy's like oh I, i didn't hear anything about you managing me and uh so roland went to jerry and he said hey man what's up i thought i was supposed to manage buddy rose tonight and uh jerry said oh yeah you know what you can manage him but first you have to go through my school and learn how to be a manager okay and that'll be twenty five hundred dollars And Roland was pissed because Jerry and Roland and and Buddy Rose, they were all friends. Roland knew a lot of the wrestlers, even though he himself wasn't a wrestler. He had trained to be a wrestler, wanted to be a wrestler. Okay. And so he helped the wrestlers out with, uh, you know, if, if one of the wrestlers needed uh, a little bit of marijuana or something like that, Roland would help him out and you know make sure he got some or whatever and uh so roland knew all these guys for years and roland was really offended that that jerry was treating him like like a mark it, you know is yeah. one of the wrestling yeah. terms you know and, yeah, we, we know and uh so we wrestled you know the match we we had the the show and uh on the way home you know, back to the Bay Area, we, we stopped at this restaurant and Roland was pissed off still about the whole situation. And Roland told told Rick Thompson at breakfast, Roland said, you know what? Fuck that guy. I'm, I'm going to open up my own school and I'm going to put him out of business. Okay, okay. So 
Roland, a few months later, he opened up his own school with Rick Thompson as the head trainer. Okay. And Rick had started training me at Jerry's place, and I could see the quality of of training difference. Okay. That, um, that was different, you know. Okay. Yeah. J Jerry Monty was an entertainment wrestler. Um, everything he did was, was like uh sticky you know it was not it wasn't real wrestling it was just it was entertainment okay and okay. rick thompson was a real wrestler yeah. you know he yeah. knew how to wrestle how to shoot um you know he really knew the the craft of wrestling the art and so i knew where i had to go for better training yeah and yeah. uh and so i ended up going with roland and and uh Rick Thompson and they opened up APW and, and, uh, I was the first, uh, assistant trainer at APW, uh, with Rick Thompson as the head coach. Nice. Okay. And we will talk about the APW, uh, in, uh, in a couple of minutes. So I uh, go ahead. Yeah, with, of uh, course. What's up, Mills? Okay. How did you come to be approached for the documentary exposed pro wrestling greatest secrets in which you were the masked wrestler private pain? Yeah. So Roland had gotten contacted by the, uh, the casting company that was, was doing the, uh, wrestling secrets exposed. Okay. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> and Roland got me, uh, Donovan Morgan and Max justice, um, all kind of like involved in the thing, the way it was presented to me, was that it was going to be a Lucha Libre wrestling movie. Okay. And everyone was going to be in masks because it was Lucha Libre. Okay. And when we got down to LA, I I had even signed a contract um, for a wrestling program tentatively called uh, The Wrestling Show is what what the working title of what we were doing was called. It was The Wrestling Show. And uh, so we get down to L.A. and right away, you know, the first very first meeting um, with the production crew and everything, uh, we became real aware right away that this was going to be an expose and not a wrestling movie. It wasn't going to be a, uh, a Lucha Libre wrestling movie at all and that it was an expose. So we were down there and it wasn't sitting right with me. I didn't like the way it was all kind of being done and it felt really cheesy. So I had basically talked to this, this lady named Kristen Curry and I had told her that, you know, I wasn't interested in doing this anymore and either was Max justice or, or Donovan Morgan. And we didn't want to be a part of it. We didn't realize what this was. So, uh, Miss Curry was like, okay, well, you know, you can do that. You, you can choose not to do this. And she said, but however, you did sign a contract with us and, um, you know, we'll have to sue you for days of lost filming. If we need to put other people in these spots, we can do that, but it's going to take us days. And we already have a production crew ready to go and film right now. So we'd be suing you for lost days of production. So I started thinking more about it. I called Roland trying to get some advice and uh, Roland was unavailable to talk to me. And uh, so the only person I was able to get a hold of was Crash Holly. Crash, okay. And, yeah, I, I, uh, Crash had, had come to APW to kind of get retrained and uh, I was working a lot with him on retraining and, uh, and so uh, Mike, Mike and I had become really good friends and, uh, we were friends when I first got into Jerry Monty's and I was working for Jerry Monty, uh, Mike, uh, Lockwood crash Holly was working for Woody farmer, another local Bay area guy. And, um, so Mike and I were friends already. And then when he came to APW, we, we became closer friends. So I was able to talk to him and 
the internet was relatively new and with, you know, with blogs and all of that stuff, it was relatively new and there was already smart marks going online saying, you know, bad things about me and, and how dare I expose the business and blah, blah, blah. And yet these are smart marks that are saying it, right? Well, how did you get smartened up to the business? You're a smart mark, right? You found a kayfabe sheet. You found the wrestling torch. Um, you know, you you smartened up somehow, but you're not a wrestler. And Crash's point was, hey, F, F everybody. He was like, fuck them all. Nobody's paying your bills, but you're going to make a lot of money with this, you know, if you do it. So he said, I think you should do it. And screw everybody, you know. He's like, who are these smart marks telling you that, you know, you can't do it? And he's like, and you know, I think we all know what wrestling is. I, I knew what wrestling was when I was when I was five, and I, I first became a fan. I already knew it was, you know, partially entertainment. Uh, you know, a guy hits you with the drop kick, and then it doesn't hurt him when he lands on the ring, right? But if he misses the drop kick, suddenly the ring is a, is like metal. You know, it's like concrete, and now it hurts him when he when he misses the drop kick. So there were all kinds of things that early on, and and you know, when I was watching wrestling, I already kind of knew it was an entertainment based sport. And um, so I went back to Kristen Curry, and I basically told her, "Hey, look, you know, we'll still do this, but we need more money. You know, like we're not getting a big cut of this. Roland is getting half of." The money that you you are you said you were going to pay us, Roland was getting half of everybody's. So the original amount was five thousand each, and we were only getting twenty five hundred because Roland was taking twenty five hundred, and that's why Roland didn't want to talk to me because Roland knew what it was. He knew what the project was that he sent us down there. He just didn't want to tell us because he knew that we would all be uh, against doing it. You know, well. When I talked to Kristen Curry, I explained to her that we were going to need a lot more money. And so she arranged for all three of us to get paid a lot more money than we were originally promised. So uh, with that, we we all three did it knowing what we were doing. And, uh, you know, I made really good money doing it. And uh, like like Crash said, no one else was paying my bills at the time. And when I look back on it, it, it certainly didn't hurt professional wrestling either. You know, uh, wrestling is more popular today than it ever was. And I think part of the reason it's so popular is that people understand what a grueling uh, sp sport it is. You know, it may, the outcomes may be predetermined, but nothing else in that ring is fake. You know, um, That's right. You know, every, every, everything hurts, you know. Yeah, it's the exactly. role for the body, and with the with the social media, it's easier to know uh, a lot of information. So uh, that's probably why also the, the popularity is growing up for professional, mm -hmm. wrestling, you know. And um, we're talking about uh, your experience in uh, your theatrical and. Uh, and uh, documentary um, uh, experiences. And we would like to um, talk about your WWE tryout uh, alongside, of course, with Mr. Tony Jones. Um, <coughs> please provide uh, us uh, your uh, experience with the, uh, the WWE for your tryout. But of course, you have been involved in the Beyond the Mad documentary. So uh, that was... Uh, on uh, for me probably one of the best um documentary oh, yeah. that uh someone who can create uh for over decades so uh, like dark side of the ring yeah exactly yeah um yeah i i really enjoyed being a part of beyond the mat and i'm still grateful to this day uh for barry blaustein and uh michael braverman and barry bloom for uh, picking me uh, for the project. Um, so for the for the documentary purposes, they 
pretended like it was my first tryout with WWE. Oh, okay. But I had had many tryouts with them. Okay, and okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, I had I'd had many tryouts with them. I had a tryout with Donovan Morgan that was really, really good. Um, I had a lot of very good tryouts with them. And they never were interested in, in signing me. I was just too small, honestly. And um, even Coco Beware was much bigger than I was. Um You know, he was a real beefy guy. He may not have been tall, but he was thick as hell. And uh, so they just were never really interested in me because of that. And when they approached me for Beyond the Mat and they explained to me that I was going to get a tryout and this and that, I, I was more concerned not with the necessarily the tryout, I was more concerned that I had 10 minutes in the ring. Typically what happens when you get a WWE tryout is they will tell you, okay, you got 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then about an hour before the show, they'll tell you, hey, you got seven minutes. And then five minutes before you go out, they'll tell you, hey, you got five minutes. Oh, shit. And then as you're going out, they tell you, hey, you got four minutes. Oh shit! And then when you get out there, they're telling you three minutes. Oh. And then as soon as you start your match, they're telling you go home. And that had happened to me quite a few times where <clears throat> I was promised 10 minutes and I had to shorten the match to two or three minutes, you know? And so what I, I told, told, uh, uh, Barry was that I wanted to be guaranteed a 10 minute tryout. I said, I want 10 whole minutes to be in that WWE ring. Otherwise I'm not interested in doing it because I know how this works. I know what, what they're going to do. They're going to tell me I've got an amount of time and they're going to cut, cut the hell out of it. And I'm going to look like shit because I'm taking a 10 minute match and I'm trying to cut it down to two minutes. I'm not going to be able to do any of my good stuff that, you know, the match isn't going to have any kind of storyline or, or anything like that. And I'm relatively unknown. So it's really hard to capture the attention of a WWE audience. It's really difficult to capture their attention in, you know, 30 seconds and yeah. then finish your match in another minute, you know? Yeah. So, I was told by Barry Blaustein that I would I would have 10 minutes. Then I was also told by Jim Cornette that I would have 10 minutes guaranteed in that ring. Mm -hmm. So as is typical, we're standing in the green room, we're ready to go, or, or the gorilla room, we're ready to go out, and uh, Bruce Pritchard says, hey guys, you're gonna have to cut that match to about five minutes. So I looked at him, I said, okay. So we go out there and when we get in the ring and you know, the referee's talking to us and stuff, the referee's like, hey guys, we're gonna have to cut it even shorter. And we start wrestling. I mean, literally I'm talking 35 seconds into the match and the referee says, hey guys, go home. He says, go home. It's time. No. And I had Tony in a headlock on the mat, and I looked up at the referee, and I said, no. Nope. And he tells Bruce Pritchard on the earpiece, he says, uh, he says, no. And I hear Bruce Pritchard yelling, go home, go home. Do they know what fucking go home means? And uh, I just told Tony, I said, no, man, we ain't going home. I said, we're going to take our 10 minutes. And we're going to do this match. So I looked at it like this. They could send a couple of wrestlers down to beat us up and kick us out of the ring. That'd be fine with me because then we'd kind of be in a storyline, you know, like I was like, fuck it. Let them do that. Let them kick us out. <laughs> um, other than that, we're taking our 10 minutes, you know. Yeah. And the other reason I wanted 10 minutes was that I already knew that Draws was in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I knew that Draws had a tryout 
and I knew that draws was already signed. So I thought to myself, okay, so in this documentary, you know, documentaries still have an objective. They still have a narrative that they want to impart upon you. <clears throat> and I realized quickly that the narrative was going to be this. The narrative was going to be that Draws got the tryout and got got signed and was a big superstar now. And that I was going to be the sad story. Wah, wah, wah. Mike <laughs> Modest had a tryout, but he just wasn't good enough. He only was able to do 30 seconds, and then his match fell apart, and he looked like shit, and that's why he didn't get signed. And I knew that's what they were going to paint me as, like the fucking loser. And so I wanted 10 minutes because if I had 10 minutes to win that crowd over and make them pop the way I knew I could, then I knew that they wouldn't be able to paint me as a loser. They might be able to paint me as the guy that didn't get the contract, but people would look at me like, I don't know why. That guy was really good and listen to the crowd reaction. Exactly. You know, so... That was the story that me and Tony ended up painting was look how good we are. And WWE still didn't sign us, you know, uh, meanwhile, God bless his soul. Uh, draws ended up getting seriously injured, uh, you know, shortly after uh, filming that. And uh, sadly, uh, my career ended up lasting a lot longer than his. Um, but. Yeah, I never regretted. Uh, Bruce Pritchard was fucking furious when we got backstage again. He was livid. He was red in the face. He looked like uh, like Brother Love with you know, <laughs> you know he, he had no makeup on, but man, he was red in the face, you know. And uh, I pretty much knew that WWE was probably never going to sign me. I just wasn't their cup of tea at the time. Uh, now, of course, later they they got real comfortable using smaller guys like Ray Mysterio, Spike Dudley, who I trained, um, you know, and Crash Holly. So later on, they started, you know, Brian Danielson. They started bringing in smaller guys. But when I was, you know, in the hunt for a WWE contract, they were not signing smaller guys. I, w I was, uh, you know. Like I said, Coco Beware was the smallest guy working for the company, and he was 235 pounds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you mentioned in this uh, documentary that Japan is one of the best places to wrestle. Do you still think so? Oh, Anyone? yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, you know, in the U.S., even in Mexico, uh, if, if you tell people – that you wrestled here, you wrestled in Mexico, you wrestled, you know, in the UK, you tell people you wrestled here or there, the other wrestlers are like, oh, cool, good for you. But when you tell another wrestler that you wrestled in Japan, they pay attention because everyone knows that uh, the Japanese strong style and, and the way they train, it's, it's just the toughest place to wrestle. You know, um, you have to know your shit to be in Japan. If you're not a good wrestler, um, those guys will eat you up. You know, you have to really know your stuff. Um, so I always knew that that's where I wanted to go. I was a big fan of all Japan. Um, you know, Mitsuhara Misawa, Kenta Kabashi, Jun Akiyama, um, Kawada, you know, all these guys that I watched in, in uh, All Japan and even New Japan, I was huge fans. I was a bigger fan of All Japan than New Japan. And uh, that's why when Noah branched off from All Japan, I really wanted to be a part of that company. And um, it was only because of a friend of mine named Ed Schumann, who was on the NWA board of directors and... Uh, he lived back in like, like Illinois or Chicago area. I think it was Chicago. And, uh, 
yeah, in fact, he came and picked me up at the airport one time just to take me out and smoke some weed and, and have some beers. I had a layover in Chicago and it was really long. And, uh, so I, I called Ed and I told him, I was like, man, I'm stuck at the airport for like 10 hours. And he goes, Oh, well, Mikey, I'll come get you. And he goes, we'll go smoke some weed and drink some beers and then I'll bring you back. <clears throat> but, uh, Ed Schumann had been contacted by um, Noah. They were coming to look at Harley Race's talent at Harley Race's school. And so I was able to, through Ed Schumann, get in touch with Noah and send them a package and basically talk to them about coming by APW. Even though I was no longer a trainer at APW, I still had a lot of loyalty towards Roland and um apw and so i arranged for uh noah to stop and and you know come see apw talent and um so that's how that's how that happened that's how we ended up getting booked with with uh with noah was they came by apw and watched a tryout um with several guys and um and so that that ended up leading me to wrestle in japan and Man, it was it was a, a dream come true. Uh, I'll never forget one of my first shows that I wrestled. I wrestled early in the card, like maybe second or third match, and then after the match, I grabbed two beers and I went up in the the, the nosebleed seats, the balcony, you know, and I was watching uh, Masawa and Kobashi and all these these fantastic wrestlers, Taue, and I'm watching all these guys drinking my beer and i'm like i i can't fucking believe this i'm being paid to be here and watch these guys live i would have paid two thousand dollars for tickets and a plane ticket to come watch these guys anytime you know like it was a it was a dream come true to watch them wrestle let alone to actually be in the ring with them and and wrestling with them you know, it was a, a real honor to be a part of that company. I felt more honored to be a part of NOAA uh, than any company that I had ever worked for in my entire career, um, including WWE and WCW. Um, I, I was more honored to wrestle for WWE, or for, to, to wrestle for NOAA, and uh, to be able to get in the ring with, with these guys that I completely idolized. And I knew that, um, you know, once I wrestled in Japan, that uh, I would have the respect of every other wrestler that, you know, wrestled anywhere else. And um, you're just before you're talking, uh, you're talked about uh, the APW. So I would like to know uh, something about uh, APW. Were you uh, at the APW training session in 2001 when Brian Ong tragically, uh, tragically lost his life due to an, an accidental incident involving uh, Great Kelly with a flapjack? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, hey guys, I'm going to go make some more coffee real quick. No problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my my internet kind of fades out when I'm when I'm on this side of the house a little bit. So if if you lose me or something, I'll be right back. No problem. Um, so I was only working with APW, um, only as a trainer with Kali. Okay. I wasn't I wasn't a part of APW anymore at the time. Uh, Donovan was now the head trainer. And uh, Vinny Massaro was the uh, assistant trainer for APW. And um, I was at home. Basically, I was overseeing the uh, training. And I wasn't there that night. And Donovan was there with Vinny Massaro. And uh, I had gotten a phone call from Donovan. And you know, I picked up the phone and Donovan told me what had happened. And okay. I was real sad. I had met, I had met Brian a few times and he was a very, very, very respectful young man, a uh, very nice guy. And, um, 
when I found out that uh, Vinny had had them doing the the flapjack, I was uh, really bummed out because the flapjack to me is a very dangerous move. And I had taken it a few times from bigger guys and it usually rung my bell. Every time I took it, I would get some kind of small concussion, you know? And uh, so it was a move I really didn't, work with people on and i would warn people that if anybody ever wants to do this with you i gotta let you know it's really dangerous you know it's the moment it's the momentum of the move it's because it's so circular um at the end of that circle you're you're coming down with a lot of momentum and uh you know, Brian and Kali should have definitely not been doing it because Brian was so small compared to Kali. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, we know that. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And if, you, and if you don't push directly on the, the shoulder and you put your head up and the guys drop down on the same time, that's... Right. That, that was uh, very dangerous, you know. Yeah. And, uh, between you and me, Kali uh, is not uh, super flexible. and He's a monster. No. Uh, yes. So, uh, this is very dangerous. So, you know. Yeah, and you're, you're coming from so high. You know, like when, when most people do the flapjack on you, you know, if a guy that's six foot does it, you know, that's one thing. But when a guy that's seven foot four does it, that's you're coming down from a long ways, you know. Exactly. And uh, sadly, what happened was Brian had taken one of them and it made him loopy, you know, and they decided, I guess, to let him do it again. But he was already not feeling good from the first one. And then he took another one. And that was the one that killed him. And um, it uh, it breaks my heart that, that he died. And I know it always has bothered Kali. Um, you know, he's one of the nicest guys I ever met. And Dalip wouldn't, wouldn't have hurt anybody, you know, um, on purpose. And uh, – that's so sad. So yeah, it was it was a terrible situation, man. Just terrible. So after Brian died, um, we made these little bandanas, you know. Okay. And at the next show, all the wrestlers wore these bandanas out out to the ring. And Roland, in bad taste, uh, Roland suggested that only the baby faces should wear the bandanas because the heels are heels, right? Yeah, I understand. And I got I got kind of pissed off at Roland and I said, Roland, this isn't an angle. Like I hate to break it to you, but this isn't an angle. We're not using Brian's death as a way to get over baby faces and heels. Mm-hmm. All the wrestlers want to wear these bandanas because we're all broken hearted that Brian's dead. Yeah, this isn't yeah. an angle, you know. Yeah, we know. So we all we all wore wore the bandanas out to the ring and stuff, and I put Brian's uh, I put Brian's bandana in my wrestling bag, and uh, it has stayed there for my entire career. Um, every every wrestling show, every entertainment thing, every acting gig. Um, every experience that I've ever had, I have brought Brian with me and I use it as a way to uh, remind myself to be very, very grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. Okay. 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 As a trainer, hold, hold, hold on a second. Let me go. I want to go get this. I want to go get this. No for problem. You. See it. No, no problem.
Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay, you got it. You, you okay, the, got it. the 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 okay. the Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 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 Nice. Wow, that, that's a piece of uh, history, you know. ONG. Wow. Yeah, so Brian's been with me my whole career. Nice. That's really okay. nice. Uh, thank you for sharing this uh this thing with yeah, thank you so much. Really okay, uh, Mr. Modest, uh, as a, a trainer uh, for the moment, of course, what is your top prospect? Who, who is your top prospect uh, at your wrestling school in uh, Las Vegas? Uh, so I no longer train uh, wrestlers. Oh, I, uh, oh. I stopped training in Las Vegas, God, years ago, uh, 10 years ago or something like that. Um so I, I don't I don't train anybody anymore. I, I kind of do seminars here and there, um, but I'm just I'm not really interested in in training anybody. Uh, you know, if I was working for like AEW or something, then I'd be more interested. But uh, what happened was um, I so I've got a five year old daughter. And so I'm no longer available on weekends. That's the only time I, I have with her is weekends. So weekends are out for me. So I, I just pretty much stopped doing everything with wrestling. I, I don't do anything with wrestling anymore. Um, uh, GCW uh, recently inducted me into their uh, independent wrestling hall of fame. <laughs> And that was the last thing I've done with, with wrestling, you know, wrestling involved. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, so a guy that I trained years ago named Big Ugly, his yeah. son is now wrestling and his son is named Titus Alexander. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, Titus is somebody to look, look for coming up. He's a hell of a talent. He's, he's got, he's got one of the best drop kicks in the business and, uh, just an incredible talent, um, incredible, uh, young man, very, uh, very humble and easy to work with kind of guy. So that, um, even though I'm not his trainer, I would say he's, he's definitely the up and coming prospect to look for Titus Alexander. Yeah. This is that guy. Okay. That's him. Yeah. So as usual, uh, it's it's already uh, practically 40 minutes of your generous time. So as usual, uh, for uh, closing our episode, uh, my partner Benoit, aka uh, Nostradamus Ben, it's all about the French prophet, you know, and he tried to predict the future of our guests. Okay. Uh, for, yeah, of course. Yes, the for, word is yours. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for the interview. It was uh, very appreciated. Uh, right on, guys. Okay. I predict to you, uh, you, uh, you're gonna make an appearance, a future appearance in an eventual uh, documentary such as uh, the Secret of Pro Wrestling or uh, Dark Side of the Ring or uh, Beyond the Map. So I'm sorry. Are you are you asking me a question? No, 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 no. It's a prediction. You're gonna oh, make an pretty... appearance in the future, a documentary. Oh, another documentary? Yeah, yeah. of course. Oh, awesome. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. This is very uh, awesome that you can uh, take your uh, 40 minutes, your 40 generous minutes. Uh, right on, guys. With uh, Mike Modis, uh, former uh, wrestler uh, with uh, – over 20 years uh, experience and uh, during this uh, episode we learn a lot of interesting story and true story and emotional uh, story yeah. of course uh thank you so much for your time and have a great right day. On. goodbye thank you guys Take thank care. you so much peace and love